Hello and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam and on this channel I will attempt to describe the science behind distilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully it'll whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you're more self-sufficient. So for this video I'm going to be talking about tips for making tequila or mezcal. So let's get started. Okay so before I get started I'd like to thank my Patreons and other supporters especially Chris, Linton, and David. All you supporters make doing these videos a lot easier on me and I can't thank you enough. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. Bearded and Bored made probably the best hobbyist video on making tequila or mezcal that I've seen on YouTube so far. My video here is simply an addendum to that video, some tips and tricks that I've picked up trying to make my own mezcal or tequila. So I'm going to go through quickly some of the points that he made but definitely do go watch his video because he touches on things that I'm not going to be touching on in this video. So he suggests a starting gravity of 1.06 to 1.07. Uh, I go 0.075 just because that's 10% ABV and I like round numbers. Temperature range 30 to 35 degrees Celsius which is 86 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit because we're trying to simulate conditions in Mexico right and these are the temperatures that they usually hit when they're fermenting their tequila or mezcal wash. Yeast, you want a yeast that can tolerate high levels of fructose. Uh, these yeasts are sometimes referred to as fructophilic. I've tracked down a couple of them. Um, Saftec Blue, Saftec Silver, and Distillamax TQ. These three were bred specifically to make tequila or mezcal. So if you can get your hands on that, probably a good idea. Distillamax LS and Lalvin 71B. These were made more for fruit washes, but since fruit are always high in fructose versus glucose, these are two good yeast to use. Talking about nutrient addition, I'm going to suggest if you can get your hands on amino acids instead of using DAP, I would go that route. But if you don't want to spend the money, then use DAP. In both cases, you will want to stage it. Or another idea would be use amino acids for the first edition of nitrogen and then DAP for the second. But yes, stage it. Bearded does his initial edition at the beginning and then measures a 30% drop in the gravity and then adds the second edition. I usually just wait between 24 and 36 hours because I'm lazy. But if I was going to be using amino acids, I would definitely be measuring it. So I'd be a lot more specific in my additions. Rule of thumb that I always use is one milligram of nitrogen per gram of sugar per liter of wash. Remember that, you know, five gallons is 20 liters. Minimum of 150 milligrams. Should have wrote that in there. 150 milligrams per liter of wash. So if you buy a syrup and you mix it in and you have your specific gravity in between these, you can go to a website like VinoCalc, which I'll link down in the description. You can, type in the, you can type in the specific gravity. It'll give you a sucrose equivalent. So let's just say 1.075 is 200 grams per liter. You'd put in 200 milligrams of amino acids or DAP per liter of wash. Pretty easy. So for 20 liters, that would be what, four grams? of DAP or amino acids. Split between your stages, so two in the beginning, two grams in the beginning, two grams for the second edition. And then since we almost always are gonna be using an agave syrup, you'll want to be monitoring your pH, just like Bearded suggests, because almost all sugar washes, which is essentially what this is, crash, their pH crashes. It will go below three if it can. So you wanna try and prevent that. Keep it above three at your most minimum. Preferably keep it above four, above four and below five if you can, as suggested by Bearded. So what's up next? Now we need to know how are we actually gonna simulate the agave so we can get that authentic tequila or mezcal flavor. And that's what I'm gonna talk about next. Okay, so simulating agave. This is what we need to do in order to make a proper mezcal or tequila. You may think, why don't I just buy an agave heart, right? Well, one agave heart, which takes seven to 14 years to grow, can actually make five to eight bottles of tequila or mezcal, which is, sounds pretty great, until you learn that they are between 40 and 90 kilograms or 80 and 200 pounds. That's gonna cost a lot of money to ship, which is why people don't usually do it. So what we need to do is simulate the agave instead. So there are essentially three major classes of compounds that we're going to have to simulate in order to do this properly. Number one, carbohydrates, the sugars. So agave stores its carbohydrates as inulin, which is sort of the fructose analog to starch. So starch is chains of glucose. Inulin is chains of fructose. During the thermal process where they roast or steam cook the agave heart, the inulin actually breaks down into fructose. They don't need enzymes to do it. Although enzymes 
do exist and they are more efficient. And then for us, since we're probably not going to be getting agave hearts and most of us probably won't be buying inulin, which you can do and turn it into fructose, we're probably just going to be buying agave syrup instead. Sometimes called nectar, but it's not actually a nectar. It's just a marketing term that they're going to be using. But yeah, agave syrup. There's lots of places you can buy it. Um, Wholesome Sweets is a company that makes syrups and they sell agave syrup for a pretty decent price. The best prices I've seen is from a company called 21 Missions Agave. They sell a lot of other things that we might find useful in this. But yeah, if I was gonna buy agave syrup in relatively large amounts, then I would give 21 Missions Agave a look first. So the second class of compounds are called terpenes. And these are essentially the odor and flavor compounds found in plants. If you've ever smelled pine oil, from uh, pine saw, you smelled a bunch of terpenes. If you've ever smelled cannabis, marijuana, you smelled a bunch of terpenes. The major terpene in agave is actually called alpha terpeniol. And there are two other plants I've found that have similar terpene profiles, and they are chicory and Jerusalem artichoke. Well, that sounds good because, you know, you may be able to buy these. The problem with these two is that it's in the, what's called the aerial part of the plant. That's the part of the plant that's above the surface. In the case of chicory, it's in the stem and the flower. And in the Jerusalem artichoke, again, it's in the stem. And when you go to buy these things, they usually do not come with the stem. When you go to buy chicory, you're usually buying chicory roots. And with the Jerusalem artichoke, you're buying the tuber itself. But luckily for us, agave terpenes are actually sold as a product by a specific company. Again, 21 Missions Agave. They sell a bottle of terpenes, 48 ounces or uh, 1.42 liters. $19. You only need to use 3.5 ounces per 5 gallons or 100 milliliters per 20 liters. So you can get a lot of uses out of this one bottle if you want to make a lot of tequila or mezcal. And we're lucky that exists because tracking down all these terpenes would be a pain in the ass. So I'm just going to say buy the terpenes from 21 Missions Agave or if you can find another place that sells it, just buy them. It's going to be easier than trying to track them down or track down other plant, other plants or other parts of plants. So the next thing we have to do, we have to look at are the cooked sugar products. These are both easy and difficult. So caramelization is easy. If you go over to Bearded and Board's video, he talks about making a boche, and I'll let you watch his video to see how to do it. That is one of the products that we need, caramelization products. Unfortunately though, simply cooking sugar does not make the more important of the two cooked sugar products, which are Maillard reaction products. These are only produced when you have amino acids and sugars together to react together under heat. So rapid reactions of these happen around 280 degrees Fahrenheit or 137 degrees Celsius, but they will start happening as soon as you get over 100 degrees Celsius or even at 100 degrees Celsius, it will happen. It's just a lot slower. We have to figure out how we're gonna make these Myriad reaction products. The first way that popped into my head was to buy some amino acids, like a nutrient product for, ye for yeast fermentation, mix it in with the agave syrup, put it in the oven at 280 degrees Fahrenheit, and just cook it for, I don't know, an hour, see what happens. I'd just try maybe 50 grams of syrup and a gram or two of the nutrients. But another way to do it would be to make your own amino acids instead of buying them. So another idea would be to get a protein isolate. I was looking at a brown rice protein isolate and some digestive enzymes like I did in that uh, video. They have proteolytic enzymes so they will break down your proteins into amino acids. And the reason I would I like this idea is that you're only going to have amino acids, peptides, and proteins present as well as the sugar instead of all that other stuff that's going to be in the nutrient mix. So my idea for this is to take 250 milliliters of water, add in about 10 grams of protein isolate, one of those digestive of enzyme pills, let it sit overnight. The next day, boil it to denature the enzymes. Then you mix in, say, 50 grams of syrup or 50 grams of inulin and then stick it in in my case i would stick it in my pressure cooker i have an instant pot and it can hit 11.6 psi which is roughly 248 degrees fahrenheit 120 degrees celsius and i'm going to cook it in that for four hours if you're going to use inulin you want to bring the ph down to four to help break the inulin apart into fructose if you don't have a pressure cooker you can still use the oven it just might take longer than four hours. I'm not sure exactly how long it's going to take. When they're making tequila or mezcal, they cook these agave hearts for eight to 24 hours, right? So four hours might not even be enough. So what I would do with this when this is all done and ready to go is I would get my fermentation bucket. I would put this at 1.060 so I know there's at least that much sugar in it. 
right? Then I would add this simulant, see what it goes up to then. And then if it doesn't change much or if it's still below 1.0, 070, I'd probably bring it up to 1.070 or 1.075. Then I would add my agave terpenes. Then I would I'd pitch my yeast. And then we get into the last part of making this tequila or mezcal because not only are we simulating the agave, right? We're simulating the conditions that they use in Mexico to ferment a, an agave wash to make tequila or, me, or mezcal. And one thing they do in Mexico everyone that makes mezcal or tequila does an open fermentation. So they keep the lid off their fermenters. And because of that, as you can imagine, they get contaminating organisms coming into their tequila or mezcal fermentation. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. Contaminating organisms. We've got this big list here. We have our yeast and our bacteria. So these show up because they're naturally on the agave itself or they're just blowing in the wind. One of the surprising things I found out about the tequila and mezcal making process is that a lot of the smaller tequila and mezcal distilleries, they will roast or steam cook their agave hearts and they take them out and they let them just sit out in the open for a few days, like one to three days. Then they will pulp them and put that into their fermenter. So during that time, they can be contaminated with all kinds of things. So I'm going to go through the yeast first, then the bacteria, and then we're going to talk about possible places to find them. So obviously the most important yeast found in a tequila fermentation or a mezcal fermentation is your Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Another yeast, Saccharomyces yeast found was called Exegus or Exegus. Not sure how to pronounce it. Hasn't been found in a lot of them, but it has been found in some of them. Another important yeast is Cloiveromyces marxianus. It was found in pretty much every single uh, study I looked at had Cloiveromyces marxianus. Then we have two Candida species, Stellata and Diversa. Then we have a Zygosaccharomyces bailey, Bisporus and Rui, Pickia fermentans and Pickia membrani fasciens, Torulospora del Bruecki, a bunch of different Bretonomyces species. Whenever you see SPP, that just means multiple species. And then a Hansenia spora uverum. So the red stars mean they showed up in a bunch of different studies that I looked at. In the case of the Zygosaccharomyces, it wasn't necessarily the Bailey species that I found, but that genus was present in a lot of different tequilas and mezcals. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is easy to find. That's going to be our main fermenting yeast. Zygosaccharomyces, I've found that White Labs sells it, but they only sell it by the liter and it's $155. So I'm not sure exactly where I'm going to find a Zygosaccharomyces. Maybe we can convince them to give us smaller samples of it for smaller amounts of money. I don't need a liter. I only need, say, 10 milliliters, maybe 20 milliliters. Maybe I can pay 20 bucks for that. I don't know. I guess we'll find out. So these two are the yeasts that are important, but I have been having trouble finding. I haven't found any Pickia sources yet, other than scientific supply companies, and they sell extremely small quantities for extremely high prices. So I don't really consider them a source yet. I have another idea for a source, and I'll put it down in the description if it works out. So in terms of bacteria, Zymomonas mobilis, uh, a whole bunch of lactobacillus species, a whole bunch of leuconostoc species, Pediococcus parvulus, Wysella sabaria, and Wysella, okay, this is a big one, Paramecin enteroides. Paramecin or Paramecin enteroides. So yeah, I saw these three show up a lot. The reason why I have this one blue starred is that I haven't found a single source. Not even companies that, you know, lab supply companies for outrageous prices for tiny amounts. I can't find this thing anywhere, yet it shows up a lot in studies on tequila, mezcal, and a non-distilled drink called pulque or pulk. That said, these three have a very easy source, or at least a lactobacillus species, usually plantarum, laconostoc, a single laconostoc species, and then pediococcus, not parvalis, but a city lactici, I think it is. These three will show up in sauerkraut starter almost always. So that's one source I'm definitely gonna buy. I'm gonna buy a sauerkraut starter, also used to make kimchi, and guaranteed you're gonna find these three in it. If you're lucky, you may find others in there as well. You may find a candida or a cleveromyces. If you know someone who makes sauerkraut, see if you can get the starter from them. They may It may have other species in it. Those are some sources you can try out. Yeast manufacturers are the other sources for some of these. A lot of places will, a lot of yeast manufacturers like White Labs offer co-fermentation products, right? So they may sell other species of sauerkraut Saccharomyces. They may sell, I know White Labs has a product that has Candida in it, and it also I think has Bretonomyces in it, but it had something else in it that I was worried about. 
they all almost all of them sell lactobacillus and almost all of them sell pediococcus and like i said white labs also has zygosaccharomyces so we're not completely without some of these things trying to get as many of them as we can will probably lead to a more authentic spirit but at minimum, the sauerkraut starter or kimchi starter, I think is the best option for the bacteria that we need. And you'll get your lactobacillus, leconostoc, and pediococcus out of that. Um, Bearded suggested throwing in the sourdough starter, which is a good idea. It will at least have a, the lactobacillus in it. It may have other things in it, depending on how it was made in the first place. And he also suggested uh, yogurt, which will also have a lactobacillus in it. I'm not going to suggest a yogurt though, because they usually also have a streptococcus bacteria in it. And I don't think it would add or take away from the flavor profile. I'd be afraid of it attacking other things present, right? Streptococcus is a pretty strong and hearty bacteria. And then once you have all this going, along with, you know, your agave syrup and your agave terpenes and the caramelized agave syrup, as well as some Maillard reaction products, I think you ferment that all together, you will come out with something that you can call a tequila or a mezcal, short of, you know, the geographical requirement to actually call it those things. But that's it for this video on uh, tequila and mezcal tips. I hope you learned something. Please click like and subscribe if you want to see more. Check out the Patreon and the PayPal donation link if you'd like to help support the channel. No pressure though. And uh, have a great week.